Greetings, church. Allow me to read from today's passage, from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewellery, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honour to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now before we get into unpacking today's passage, I hope that you will not assume that today's sermon applies only to married people. And you know, and if you're not married, you can just switch off quite literally since you're watching this on YouTube. But Peter addresses wives in this letter because in their context and culture, most women in the church would have been married. And although that is not necessarily the case today, some of the principles we will look at today do apply to all women. And likewise, although Peter addresses husbands here, all men need to pay attention to what it means to honour and treat women correctly. So allow me to open us in prayer. Lord, we come to you this day looking into your word, seeking to understand, Lord, your call, your will for us as men, as women, as husbands or wives, to understand, Lord, how you have made us to be in your image and what you have called us to be, Lord, and how you want us to live out our relationship with one another. So we commit this time to you. Pray that you will speak to us, Lord, through your word, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if we look at the first verse in verse 1, the very first word, likewise. Now, you know, as you learn about uh, how to do Bible study, I remember learning uh, something very, something that, that really um, has, has stayed with me. That's if you see the word therefore at the start of a passage, you have to ask yourself, why, what is it there for? You know, what is it there for? Is it, it's linked to what happens before. Likewise, if you see the word likewise, you should be asking, like, why is this here? So let's look. We need to look at the earlier passages. Just have a quick recap of the earlier passages in 1 Peter chapter 2, which addressed how to live as a Christian in the different areas of our lives that God has ordained, under the authority that God has put in place in each area. We learned about this in the last two sermons preached by Elder Ronald Wong. We learned about how in our country, as a citizen, what it means to be subject to the authorities that God has put in place. In our workplace, as an employee, what it means to be subject to those over us with all respect. And today we will look at the home, what submission at home looks like in the relationship as husband and wife. And in the subsequent sermon, Pastor Adrian will be looking at the church, what it means to submit to each other and serve each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know, as you look at these four areas or arenas in our life, whether as a citizen of the country or in our workplace or in the home or in the church, we know that the conditions and situations that we face in each of these realms may be far from perfect. And they may be filled with many struggles and even strife. 
And Peter acknowledges that. Yet in each circumstance, we are called to submit ourselves to the Lord and be subject to the authority structure that he has ordained. As John Piper puts it, submission is a wider Christian value, Christian virtue for all of us to pursue. And it has its unique and fitting expressions in various relationships. So today we're going to look at the relationship that is marriage and the marriage and family relationship that is addressed in today's passage. And Peter first addresses the married women. Now there's a bit of background that's needed here. It's very likely that as the gospel spread throughout the region, many women put their faith in Jesus and chose to follow him as they heard the good news about Jesus that was preached by whether it was the apostles or the, the disciples or, or, or many others who, who were living out their faith in daily life. But in some cases, these women's husbands had either not heard the gospel or most likely they had chosen, they had heard it but chosen not to respond to the good news. And so they did not obey the word, as verse 1 says. In other words, the husbands remained unbelievers. Now, in some cases, these husbands not only rejected the gospel, but also rejected their wives who had become Christians, and they separated from them. And in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15, it actually addresses these situations and even giving allowance for separation in such circumstances. But other husbands continued to live with their wives, even though they did not share the same faith. So how then should these women live out their faith, whether or not their husband was a believer? And that's what verses 1 to 6 address. Now, I've just put them into three very uh, succinct points for us to, to take a look at, give us a broad overview of this passage. Verses 1 to 2 talk about wives being subject to their own husbands, demonstrating respectful and pure conduct. Verses 3 and 4 talk about being adorned, made beautiful from the inside, with a gentle and quiet spirit. And verses 5 and 6 talk about doing good and not fearing or being intimidated by anything. So how is submission to one's husband linked? As we see in verses 1 and 2, how is it linked to respectful and pure conduct? Pastor John Piper has written and spoken much on the topic of men's and women's complementary roles. Listen to what he says on the issue of submission and see how it's very much linked to respectful and pure conduct. He says, Submission is the divine calling of a wife to honour and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. It's the dis disposition to follow a husband's authority and an inclination to yield to his leadership. It's an attitude that says, I delight for you to take the initiative in our family. I'm glad when you take responsibility for things and lead with love. I don't flourish in the relationship when you are passive and I have to make sure the family works. But, he goes on to say, submission does not follow a husband into sin. What, does, what then does submission say in such a such situation? It says, it grieves me when you venture into sinful acts and want to take me with you. You know I can't do that. I have no desire to resist you. On the contrary, I flourish most when I can respond joyfully to your lead, but I can't follow you into sin. As much as I love to honour your leadership in our marriage, Christ is my King. So that's how, even in submitting to the husband, a wife demonstrates respectfulness and, and, and pure conduct. Now, this whole issue of being subject to the husband or, or the issue of submission is one that has been so misunderstood or twisted that John Piper illustrates six more things that submission is not. And this is something that is, I think it would be helpful for us to, to take note of. Six things submission does not mean, based on 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Firstly, submission does not mean agreeing with everything your husband says. 
you can see that in verse 1. The wife is a Christian and he and the husband is not. He has one set of ideas about, about God, about ultimate reality. She has another. And Peter calls her to be submissive while assuming she will not submit to his view of the most important thing in the world, which is God. So submission can't mean submitting to agree with all that her husband thinks. Secondly, submission does not mean leaving your brain or your will at the wedding altar. It's not the un inability or the unwillingness to think for yourself. I mean, you see in this passage, here is a woman who heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. She thought about it. She assessed the truth claims of Jesus. She apprehended in her heart the beauty and worth of Christ and his work. And she chose Jesus. Her husband heard it also. But he has chosen, he has not chosen Christ. She thought for herself and she acted. And Peter does not tell her to retreat from that commitment. Thirdly, submission does not mean avoiding every effort to change a husband. Now, I know that sounds contrary to what we may have often heard, that wives may um, try very hard to change their husbands, but it's not possible. But the whole point of this text, or one of the points of this text, is really to tell a wife how to win her husband. In verse 1, it says, Be subject to your own husband, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And if you didn't care about the Bible, you might say, Submission has to mean take, uh, just taking the husband the way he is and not trying to change him. But if you believe what the Bible says, you conclude that submission, paradoxically, is sometimes a strategy for changing him. Fourthly, submission does not mean putting the will of the husband before the will of Christ. And that's linked to some of the earlier points made. The wife is a follower of Jesus before and above being a follower of a husband. And submission to Jesus relativizes submission to husbands and governments and employers and parents. When Sarah called Abraham Lord in verse 6, it was Lord with a lowercase l. It's like sir or my lord. And the obedience she rendered is qualified obedience because her supreme allegiance is to the Lord with a capital L. Fifthly, submission does not mean that a wife gets her personal spiritual strength primarily through her husband. A good husband should indeed strengthen and build up and sustain his wife. He should be a source of strength. But what this text is showing is that when a husband's spiritual leadership is lacking, a Christian a wife is not bereft of strength. Her hope and her strength is ultimately in God. And finally, submission doesn't mean that a wife is to act out of fear. Verse 6 says, You are Sarah's children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. In other words, submission is free. It's not coerced by fear. A Christian woman is a free woman. When she submits to her husband, whether he is a believer or unbeliever, she does it in freedom, not out of fear. And you know, linked to that point, I think it's also very important to emphasize one more area that submission can and has been misunderstood, and that's with regards to abuse. For example, even in cases of domestic violence. And Christians are not exempt from this. In fact, they may even be, may have misunderstood the intention of this, of uh, these passages and this, the teachings in the Bible to say that a wife should submit herself to abuse, even physical, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse as a form of submission. Take note of this. Abuse is not in God's design for any relationship. Abuse in any form is always wrong. We are not called to subject ourselves to abuse or abusive relationships. The abused person should not remain silent or continue on in that situation. She or he, because there are cases also of that where it is the man that is abused, she or he should seek help. If not addressed, abusive relationships only tend to get worse over time. 
And there are helplines available. You can refer to the link on screen. And church leaders are also available to help. Because if any of our members are in abusive relationships, all care will be taken to protect the victim's privacy while ensuring their safety. And we will provide pastoral support to connect with professional help and assistance if needed. And if possible, where possible, we will also confront the, po the person who behaved in an abusive way. And if they're willing to get help themselves, then to help them manage their anger or emotions or whatever has, has led to that abuse. But if there's a likelihood that the abuse will be repeated, the priority is ensuring that the safety uh, ensuring the safety and care for those who may be abused and they should be taken out of the abusive situation as soon as possible. So re please remember, you are not called to subject yourself to abuse or a, a, a abusive relationship, nor should you suffer in silence. Seek help to stop the abuse. Now next in verse 3, Peter addresses what beauty in God's sight is. He says, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, jewellery, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, it, which in God's sight is very precious. Now the word adorn means to make beautiful or attractive. And what this verse is really saying is, don't let what makes you beautiful be something external. Let what is within you make you beautiful. And what is it that makes a woman beautiful? In God's eyes, a picture of true beauty, as this verse says, is a gentle and quiet spirit. Now this isn't referring to one's personality, saying that only those who are uh, very perhaps very meek and quiet, are pleasing to God. But it's referring to one's inner person, one's inner peace. It's a picture of strength and security in God that produces that, that gentleness and quietness in spirit. And that's a beauty that the world cannot reproduce. It means not relying on external things or adornments to give you a sense of worth. Not relying on other people, whether it's your spouse or others, to have a sense of worth. And not needing to exert or flaunt yourself to try to influence or control another. And you know, this very much is linked to what Proverbs 31 verse 30 says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. But you know, the reality is that the world preys on women's insecurities. Women are constantly told you need to have that perfect figure, the perfect makeup, the per perfect clothes. And all of this preys on the insecurities that, that women struggle with each day. But the Bible, God tells women, find your true beauty and worth in God. Find your true beauty and worth in God. And this is the kind of beauty that all Christian women can possess, not just married women. I want to quote something that I read from this Christian author by the name of Abigail Dodds. And she wrote this article called Five Truths for Our Daughters. She was writing to, uh, I think I believe she has two daughters who are still growing up and this is something that she, she wants them to know as they grow up. One of the points she says is this, beauty is part of womanhood in a way that isn't part of manhood. It need not be your enemy, nor should it be counted on as a friend. Accept the external beauty God's given you as part of his particular design for you. Give thanks and move on realizing that it is not the substance of your personhood, but simply a gift. Do not waste your time wishing you were other than you are and dishonoring your maker. God made you and he made you beautifully so that he could give us a picture of what he wants our souls to be like. He wants you to cultivate a beautiful spirit 
spend your time on this, not looking in the mirror. There is only one mirror that will show you yourself. It is the Word of God. Find yourself there. Find yourself hidden in Christ. Find yourself hidden in Christ. And this very much links to what we read next in verses 5 and 6. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now it's very interesting that Peter cites Sarah and Abraham here. Because if we read the story in Genesis, we know that Abraham obeyed God's call to go to the promised land that he had never seen. And Sarah submitted to Abraham, even though Abraham wasn't perfect. And he made some questionable decisions along the way. And Sarah must have had to face many uncertainties and fears. But in the end, she didn't put all her faith and hope in Abraham, but in God. And she did not let her uncertainties and fears intimidate or stop her. And in the end, her faith and hope in God was proven true when God redeemed her and Abraham out of different challenging and frightening situations. So therein lies the key to this whole passage, that everything the wife is called to do, no matter how difficult it seems, is made possible only because of hope in God. And the model is holy women who hoped in God, who were subject to their own husbands, demonstrating respectful and pure conduct, who because of that hope in God, were made beautiful from the inside with a quiet, with a gentle and quiet spirit. And because of that hope in God, could do good and not be fearful or intimidated by anything. That is the key. Hope in God. You know, the world may say, if you want to win someone over, you use charm or beauty or perhaps more forceful methods, emotional and psychological methods or constant nagging or belittling the person, insulting them or their beliefs, hitting them over the head with the Bible. I think if you've done that or if you've been on the receiving end, you'll know that will not work. But what will, what will win someone over to Christ? And that's a, that's a key thing that we see starting from uh, in verse 1. The key again is hope in God. Seeing the sense of security and serenity that comes from hope in God. The kind of hope that allows one to go through trials and tribulations. The kind of hope that produces fearlessness and quiet confidence in God. As opposed to a constant state of anxiety it is the testimony that one who, has, who endures suffering, mindful of God, has hope. And that's something that Elder Ronald reminded of us of last week. That whether it's in the workplace or in the marriage, that hope in God is what keeps us going and hope in God is what can transform the people around us as they see for themselves the truth and the power of God at work in us. Because hope in God means that sense of security. It means fearlessness. It means peace in God and in His sovereignty. It means it leads to a gentle, respectful and pure conduct that will win others to Christ. And we see this even later on in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 15 and 16. Right, verse 15 says, 
In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So hope in God is a testimony to all those around us, whether it's an unbelieving spouse, whether it's a colleague, whether it's a neighbour. Hope in God is the key. So that is the call to wives and to all women who hope in God. And if you think about it, it's something that all of us, men included, should also learn from, to hope in God. But next, Peter specifically addresses the husbands. And it may just be one verse, but there are many implications therein. Now let's take a look at that. Verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honour to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So this call to husbands is again linked to all the other instructions that have been given before. It is also a call to um, submission. It is a call to hope in God, to putting one's hope and faith in God and not in anything else. And how does it live out? How does it play out in a, in a man's life, in a husband's life? That's what this verse is, is, is saying. And I believe this is a wake-up call for husbands and men in general. Because I believe that many of us, for many of us, the women in our lives are incredibly strong and competent. I know that's very much true for my, for in my life. But we need to recognize that even they have limitations and not to place unfair expectations or burdens on the wife and to step up and to lead and to protect the family. Because this verse also says something that is very serious and we, we mustn't miss, that if we do not live with our wives in an understanding way, if we do not honour and protect her, or any woman for that matter, if we mistreat, neglect, deliberately frustrate, take for granted, or expect them to take on all the burdens and responsibilities, if we do not respect or honour them, it is as bad as persistent sinning, and God will not listen to our prayers. Now why do I say this? Because the end of verse 7 says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And this brought to mind uh, the verse in Psalm 66, verse 18, where it says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So if we don't cherish our wife, it's the same as cherishing sin. If we don't cherish our wife, we are cherishing sin. And God will not listen. So if we, we need to have an honest evaluation of how we are treating our wives or the women in our lives. And if we need to, to repent and seek reconciliation, we should do so. Just like Matthew 5, 23 to 24 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. So before we try to approach God in prayer, we should also ask, how are we treating our wives? Do we need to repent? Do we need to reconcile with them? Do we need to ask for their forgiveness? I just want to share some more points that um, talk about what it means to be a mature masculine leader, what, what mature masculine leadership looks like, in the words of John Piper. It serves and sacrifices for a woman's good. A man is called to lead a woman by serving her, not demanding to be served. It points the woman to, Christ, to, the woman to Christ. The husband's role is to help the wife learn to depend on Christ. And it makes the most of other strengths. A godly leader doesn't try to demonstrate his own superiority. Instead, he brings out the strengths of others. A man should treat his wife like a fellow heir, just like 
Verse 7 says, A co-heir in Christ. A man should treat his wife like a fellow heir, not like a servant or a child. And a man also should take the general responsibility to initiate. And now general is the key word here. Because in some areas, the wife will take the initiative according to her gifts. But the man, however, has the general responsibility for his family's spiritual welfare. He's not to be passive while his wife shoulders the burden. He goes on to say this, In a good marriage, decision-making is focused on the husband, but it's not unilateral. He seeks input from his wife and often adopts her ideas. This is implied in the love that governs the relationship. From Ephesians 5.25, we see this. And also in the equality of personhood implied in being created in the image of God, Genesis 1.27. And in the status of being fellow heirs of the grace of life, which we saw just now in 1 Peter 3.7. Unilateral decision-making is not usually a mark of good leadership. It generally comes from laziness or insecurity or inconsiderate disregard. On the other hand, dependence on team input should not go to the point where the family perceives a weakness of indecision in the husband. And both husband and wife should agree on the principle that the husband's decision should rightly hold sway if it doesn't involve sin. But this conviction doesn't mean that a husband will often use the the prerogative of veto over the wishes of his family or, or his wife. He may, in fact, very often surrender his own preference for his wife's, where there's no moral issue at stake. But his awareness of his sin and imperfection will guard him from thinking that following Christ gives him the ability of Christ to know what's best in every detail. Nevertheless, in a well-ordered biblical marriage, both husband and wife acknowledge in principle that if necessary, in some disagreement, the husband will accept the final, the burden of the, making the final choice. The husband will accept the burden of making the final choice. And that is a heavy responsibility that we cannot take lightly as men. And so we should humble ourselves before God in a, for our failures and for the remaining tendency that we have to shirk or overstep our responsibilities. The call to leadership it's not a call to exalt ourselves over any woman. It's not a call to domineer or belittle or put woman in her place. She is, after all, a fellow heir of God and destined for a glory that will one day blind the natural eyes of every man. Call to leadership is a call to humble oneself and take the responsibility to be a servant leader in ways that are appropriate to every different relationship to women. It's a call to risk getting egg on our faces, meaning you know, making mistakes, to pray as we've never prayed before, to be constantly in the Word, to be, given, to be more given to planning, more intentional, more thoughtful, less carried along by the mood of the moment, to be disciplined and ordered in our lives, to be tender-hearted and sensitive, to take the initiative to make sure there is a time and place to talk to her about what needs to be talked about, and to be ready to lay down our lives the way Christ did, if that is necessary. So we see here, from this whole passage, the call to be a godly wife or a godly husband is a weighty one. And it can and often will feel overwhelming. But the key remains the same, to put our hope in God that he is sovereign over our relationship and our lives, that if and when we stumble and fall or get lost along the way, he is there to help us get up and carry on, and that as we continue to put our hope in him, he will transform us from the inside out, and in so doing, our marriage and family life too will be transformed. Let us pray. Lord, we have read and we have heard your call to us as men and women, as husbands and wives. And Lord, we can only call out to you, Lord, cry out to you, Lord, for your grace and strength to live out this calling. to remember that all of this is only possible if we constantly have in mind 
our hope in you. That this is not possible on our own strength, using our own methods, using the ways of the world, but it is only possible by your grace, by the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, pray, Lord, that you would empower us by your Spirit to live as the holy men and women of God, putting our hope in you, loving one another as we should, in our families, in our marriage, marriages, in our, in our homes, in, in everywhere that you have placed us on. May we live out these relationships the way that you have called us to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.